first reading is from Isaiah chapter 62, verse 1 through 5, on page 1159 in your pew Bible. Zion's new name. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will, you, will your God rejoice over you. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 11, on page 1785 in your pew Bible. <coughs> spiritual gifts. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge, by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one, just as he determines. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's gospel reading comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Glory to you, O Lord. On the day a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee, Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time is not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used for Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they, are fill so they filled them to the brim. And when the heat then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first miraculous of his signs, Jesus performed in the Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ, and please be seated. We have all been there before, haven't we? Or at least many of us have. The wedding party that beats all wedding parties. You know what I'm talking about. The one that people absolutely couldn't wait until the actual wedding ceremony was over. I mean, come on, for many of us, you have to admit it's the wedding reception. It's the party afterwards, after the wedding, where a lot of the memories are made. It's the food, it's the DJ, it's the dancing, and the times. 
yes is the awkward toast. Thank you. And yes, it is the awkward toast by the best man. Now here we are today hearing a story. Jesus is at a wedding. And the wedding reception was rocking in the wine, red run out, and we hear about Jesus' first miracle. When I was growing up, there was, there was no alcohol, let alone wine, in the house. My parents didn't drink, and what was especially true for my, mo- for my father, alcohol was a taboo. It was always bad. This issue was black and white. There was no room for gray, and alcohol was always a bad thing no matter what. And now he loosened up later in life. However, there were always this, there's always this tinge of strict adherence to the prohibition. My pietistic upbringing would be glad to hear the story of the shortfall planning by the bridegroom in the story today. Jesus, however, sees the frugality of as a mistake he can take care of, taking charge of a potential social catastrophe. I mean, you can hear it, can't you? You can hear it, can't you? Did you, did you hear about the wedding? Did you know that the wine ran out? What a party faux pas. What a social cat- catastrophe. And in a shame and honor society in the time of Jesus, you'd have to carry that shame with you from that event. And you'd be defined by that shame. However, good thing Jesus is there because he has some empty jars filled with water and turns water into wine. Extravagant? Reckless? Yes, absolutely. John tells us that this is the first sign of the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't call a prayer meeting or have a worship service as his first act. His first act of power is instead livening up a party. Wine is a common symbol in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament for God's abundance. And here in the story we certainly have the abundance, don't we? Now the details of the abundance can't be overlooked in this text. Six water jars, 20 to 30 gallons each, filled to the brim the best wine. The amount in and of itself is extraordinary, but, but the best wine at this point in the celebration, it's unheard of. Back in the day, weddings typically lasted a number of days where the host would serve the better wine when the guests could actually taste what they were drinking. And it was only after a few days of drinking that a certain level and a certain level of inebriation would the guests be served the cheap stuff. This is abundant grace. The word grace only occurs four times in the Gospel of John. And it happens, they all happen in the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. We didn't read that part, that comes earlier on. Four times and it comes earlier on. So why is this? Why does John only mention grace at the very beginning of his Gospel? Well, if we take a look at the Incarnation seriously, this... What, we, what if we take this, this God taking human form seriously and suggest that once the Word became, becomes flesh, which is Jesus, this Jesus coming into the world, that the rest of the gospel shows us what it is that grace tastes like, what it looks like, what it smells like, what it sounds like, and what it feels like. This is... The signs that Jesus performs throughout the book of John, they show us. They don't tell us. They show us what abundant grace is. As we we can read earlier in John, 
he writes, from Jesus' fullness, from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Turning water into wine is a revealing of God's abundance and grace. What does abundant grace look like? Like the best wine when you're expecting the cheap stuff. It's one thing to say Jesus is a source of all grace. It's totally different to have an experience of grace. In our world today, where do we see God's abundant grace? What does grace look like to you? Abundant grace tastes like the best wine when you're experiencing cheap wine. Abundant grace feels like walking outside for the first time on a warm, sunny day after being cooped up in the house all of January with, with a case of cabin fever. The sunshine and the mild temperature lift your spirit, bring a smile to your face, and you feel alive. Just not today. <laughs> Abundant grace ex experienced when the world tells you that you're no good that you don't deserve a second or even a third chance and someone comes along and loves you anyway and walks with you towards becoming a more whole person. Abundant grace feels like a community of love surrounding you with love after, you, after a difficult diagnosis of health. Abundant grace looks like the motley crew of misfits and addicts and others who find us feel a sense of belonging, of value, and of love in community where they are not left out. Abundant grace looks like light, seeing light at the end of a tunnel after a long, unhealthy relationship. You may have your own story of abundant grace. One of the other key pieces to Jesus' brilliance in this first miracle is that he doesn't, Jesus doesn't conjure up fresh jars of wine. He uses the existing, and they may have been even abandoned, ritual vessels for a new and radical purpose. And I wonder if we as followers of the winemaker, as followers of Jesus, that we as the church, the body of Christ, I wonder if we have the same capacity. I mean, drive around any city, any town, and countryside for that matter. On a Sunday morning, and you'll probably see rapidly emptying ritual vessels trying to keep their doors open, let alone a vibrant ministry going on. Going on. There are churches that are dying everywhere, waiting for the Holy Spirit to bring new life into old water jars. Two short stories. In my first call as pastor, the ministry where I served, we existed because another church had closed its doors. It was because of a dying church's vision and passion to bring life into a neighborhood and a community that, that the funds that we received from the sale of the church building went to start two new significant ministries in that same community. Ministries that looked nothing like the one whose doors had just closed. The church building now houses a growing Ethiopian Orthodox church, and some of the old church's funds were used to start up a ministry reaching out to people living on the streets, in shelters, and others whom society had forgotten. And when this all took place, when this all took place, we came, all came together. We gathered around for this dynamic celebration of life, unlike any that I'd ever experienced. With Ethiopian drums and dancing and the gospel choir singing and people from all walks of life coming together to celebrate new life coming out of old water jugs. It was a beautiful picture of abundant grace. A glimpse of the kingdom of God. 
and also happened to be the service in which celebrated my ordination to be a pastor. What a gift that day was. Story number two. This text reminds me of the Danish film called Babette's Feast, which won an Academy Award a number of years ago for best foreign film. The story unfolds in the late 19th century in a small fishing village on a dank and dreary coast of Denmark. And two sisters had given up their own ambitions to take care of their ailing father, who was an elderly pastor of this stern and tiny church. And the church's band of gruff and unfriendly Christians learned the meaning of God's abundant grace from the most unlikely source. When a French refugee named Babette invades their small world, and in a highly symbolic act, Babette, who was a famous chef in Paris, cooks the villagers this beautiful, sumptuous, abundant feast. And at first, the stingy villagers can't allow themselves to enjoy such extravagance, but they loosen up and learn to accept celebration and abundance. My friends, this Jesus, this Jesus, this friend of sinners who is accused of being a glutton and a drunkard, reveals a God who is about abundant goodness, even showing that it can come out of places in our lives where there doesn't seem to be much life at all. In the story from the Gospel of John, we discover a God who is a God of unlimited and unconditional grace. It's a grace that leads us to becoming a more whole people. May we find the wisdom and the strength and the courage to help our community and the world around us to experience what God's extravagant and reckless grace feels like, tastes like, smells like, and looks like. People of God, it is only then, it is only then that we will all experience wholeness within ourselves, within the lives of our neighbors, and the lives of the world around us. Because God's abundant grace is good news for you. It's good news for me. It's good news for the world. Amen. I go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>